hello and let's talk about sperm. Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford and today we're talking about low sperm counts. It's been a bit, so welcome to the YouTube channel. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI. I'm a fertility doctor and I talk about fertility every single day and I talk about sperm all the time. And so often this is a topic that people don't know or don't want to talk about. So I'm going to be breaking it down for you. This will be a quick video so that you can learn all the basics. The first thing to understand is that sperm is not a constant thing. It is constantly made and regenerated. So unlike inside the ovary, somebody's going to be born with all the eggs they're ever going to have, and they're going to run out of eggs over time. And when they're out of eggs, they're in menopause. In the testes, there are cells that can make brand new sperm every single day. And the entire lifespan of a sperm from creation start until seen and ejaculate is approximately three months long. So that means that sperm can be really different on three month interval based on how healthy you are, what you're exposed to, and this can be both good and bad. I think this is good because this means that you can take control of things and make changes and see those changes in your semen analysis. So let's dive into just a couple quick things about a low sperm count and things I want you to know about. The first is going to be when we do a semen analysis, Keys to this is going to be collecting a good sample. So we want you to abstain for two to three days before the semen analysis. That way we have an appropriate standard based on what we're looking at. If you abstain for seven days or 10 days, which I see people do this all the time, I know there's mentality is like, oh, I'll, I'll save up sperm so it'll be better, but sperm are really fragile so they won't still be around. So if you are abstaining, what we're going to see is that if you have too long of an abstinence interval, there's going to be a lot of debris and dead sperm. So it's not doing you any favors. Follow the instructions. These are the World Health Organization's parameters for normal sperm. So what we're looking at here is going to be volume, concentration, motility, and morphology. Those are going to be the most important criteria. So we look at the volume, that is going to be the milliliters of the sperm. The concentration is how many million sperm you have in each milliliter. So normal here, and this is the low end of normal. So I want you to see the top normal greater than the fifth percentile. So if you're less than this, this means that you're in the fifth percentile of the lowest sperm counts. So most or average is going to be well above these cutoffs. So volume would be 1.5 and a Concentration is going to be 15 million per ml. From there, what we should see is going to be a motility of at least 40%. These values together are going to give us what we call the total modal sperm count. And this is how many sperm are moving in the entire sample. And also an important factor is going to be the morphology or the shape of the sperm. Now these are controlled by different factors. So the brain and the testes have to communicate in order to make sperm. So when you look at the concentration alone, this is going to be reflective of the brain's hormones and the testes ability to respond to them. So one top reason of having no sperm or what we call azoospermia is actually iatrogenic use. Like you're using testosterone. And by using that testosterone, it's telling the brain we don't need sperm because we have sperm. And that's because the pathway from the brain to the testes is making both sperm and testosterone. So LH from the brain from the pituitary gland stimulates the testes to make testosterone and FSH from the brain stimulates the testes for what we call spermatogenesis or to make sperm. So if you're taking testosterone because you have low libido or fatigue, which does happen if your testosterone is low and somebody gives you testosterone to make you feel better, you might feel better, but what's going to happen from the brain is then you're not going to have a stimulus anymore to make any testosterone because you're not going to make any sperm. And suddenly now you're taking male birth control and when you've taken testosterone, it can take 10 to 14 months to have spermatogenesis return. And the longer you've used T, the longer that might take. And I've had some patients who never had sperm return. This is probably one of the top things that I would project into the world because people walk in to clinics or to doctors and they know they want to have children and they get put on something that potentially could make it so that they can't. And nobody is either explaining it to them or or more likely the person giving it to them doesn't fully understand. So 
you've got to be an advocate for your own health. All right, so when we look at this, it's just a few things about male factor. One is that there are sperm abnormalities, a male factor present in half of patients with infertility, and male factor is the only cause in 20%, and these are really huge numbers. So this is why if you walk into the office and you say, I don't want a semen analysis, it doesn't make sense. Even if, you know, there's a partner who's not ovulating or other known issues, 50% of people with infertility, there is a contributing male factor in addition to a female factor. So certainly a semen analysis is a really important part of this evaluation. When we look at something called oligospermia or having a low sperm count, that can be classified on different levels based on if it's mild, moderate, or severe based on how low it is. Again, azoospermia is going to be no sperm. Oligo is going to be that concentration is less than 15 million per ml. When you have oligospermia, one thing that's frustrating is that 75% of the time, you're not going to get an answer for why you have that oligospermia. And that is tough. That doesn't mean that it's not worth looking into it, especially if it's low. The lower that it is, the more important this could be for your health, for other factors. So here's a one graph and it's showing you that in the white, most of the time in this study, there was no reason or no found reason. And these are people who had a full evaluation for it. Other categories, the next mo most common was congenital. So having a birth defect that caused you to not have sperm or not have enough sperm. And this graph is from people who had just male infertility. It's not just people who had oligospermia. So you can see, congenital birth defects, then there's also things like just testicular, sexual dysfunction, genetic causes. So when we start looking at these, some of the things that can happen is that we always want to look at where the deficit might be. So if you went through puberty fine and normal, there are some rare genetic things that are not going to be going on and we're going to ignore them. But if we're going to look at more common things, it can be pituitary issues. So your pituitary glands not sending out FSH or LH. I have seen this with patients who have a prolactinoma or a pituitary mass. That is one of the things that can cause that HPO axis or hypothalamic pituitary testicular HPT axis, but essentially causes the pituitary gland not to send out any hormones. I've also seen abnormalities in sperm with severe thyroid disease. So checking blood for thyroid and prolactin is pretty easy. There's also something called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is something where the adrenal glands make an increase of steroids. And when that happens, it actually suppresses the same way the brain from telling the testes to make testosterone. So then you have low sperm counts and it's all because you're having androgens made through another source. Again, this can be screened with a blood test. So when you start going on this pathway, there is blood work that can be done that can give you some of the answers. Some of the genetic syndromes that might be diagnosed later can be what we call deletions in specific areas of the Y chromosome. So what we call the AZF locus, and notably there are certain areas that can cause problems with sperm production. There's also something called Klinefelter syndrome, which is having an extra X chromosome. So in Klinefelters, you have XXY. So there's a chromosome duplication. Essentially, you have three sex chromosomes. This can be diagnosed by having low testosterone, having little to no sperm. And there's often other features that can be associated with it as well. It's not inherited. It's a random genetic disorder, but you can check this by looking at a karyotype or a chromosome panel of your blood. You can have testicular issues. So with the, whether this is you had undescended testes, whether you had testicular torsion at one point where there was an impaired blood supply to a testy, whether you had a varicocele or you have one, which is a dilated blood vessel that can cause both heat or hyperthermia. We know the testes are outside the body because they like to be at a lower body temperature, but they can also cause testicular atrophy, lower testosterone production. And then there's other things that get into these lifestyle factors. So obesity, diabetes, medication use. So things like finasteride that somebody might take for hair loss, opiates if you have chronic pain, if you have to take steroids because you have like really terrible asthma, if you use marijuana, if you're on certain antidepressants, if you've had chemotherapy in the past. So this is a chart of different medications that can impact the ability to make sperm. And then just overall life and body. So chronic stressors, chronic illness, we saw with COVID a huge drop in sperm counts. 
And I think that all of this has to go into the full picture. It's also combined with female partner evaluation goals and age, because I might find somebody who's got a very low sperm count and on the full picture, age of the female partner or block tubes, we're doing IVF, that has been answered. So we're walking that pathway to get you pregnant. And you might concurrently go to a urologist to get an evaluation to figure out what's going on with your sperm. Just like I say period or a menstrual cycle is a vital sign for women, a semen analysis is for men. One thing that I see sometimes is that somebody will go to the urologist and they will have low energy or low T and they'll appropriately see a urologist. But then the urologist will be working on medications to try to improve sperm, all of that's fine but they never send the female partner for an evaluation. And that can just be a missed opportunity because we can at the same time be evaluating that female partner. We might find something that changes our goals for how much sperm we need. And because of the length of time, usually it can be, you know, at the minimum, it's going to be three months. It can be six months, or as I said, after T use, it can be 10 to 14. It can take a long time to get sperm production back to where it needs to be if it is even possible. So we hate to have wasted that time and not at least had the full picture or been able to make our own decisions. All right, so having a low sperm count is something that is sometimes how your body is made, like if it's genetic, but also can be influenced by the world around you and what you are exposing your body to, the medications you are taking in your life. So this is a place where it's good for you to get information because again, male factor contributes to 50% of all cases of infertility. As always, I appreciate you being here. You can learn more information on the As A Woman podcast or submit your questions below and we'll get to answering them. Thanks, friends.